Welcome to Primary Care Pharmacology. This episode will be focusing on calcium channel blockers. These are pretty common medications and you're probably using them very often in your day-to-day -day practice. But if you've ever wondered the difference between a dihydropyridine and a non-dihydropyridine, or why adamlodipine is better than philodipine, then this video hopefully is for you. I'm going to divide the video into six different sections. I'm first going to have a look at the formulary of available calcium channel blockers in the UK. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about their indications and pharmacology, and then we're going to move on to their practical day-to-day -day use, uh, including contraindications and side effects. So, looking at formulary, as I've previously mentioned, there are two main classes of calcium channel blocker, the dihydropyridines and the non-dihydropyridines. These are also known as the non-rate limiting and rate limiting calcium channel blockers respectively. I'm going to use dihydropyridine as if you look in the literature that's generally the name that uh, most people use and I think it's easier just to stick with one. Uh, let's start with the non-dihydropyridines as this is a much smaller list and there are two drugs in this category, diltiazem and verapamil. Now one of the novel things about these drugs is they're one of those groups of drugs that is generally prescribed by brand name. We do this because the different brands have slightly different pharmacology and you can't necessarily use them interchangeably. Of course, in the modern age, it's actually quite difficult to get the same brand reliably in most pharmacies. So more often now we are prescribing generically, but really you should be choosing a brand and sticking with it to get the best result for your patient. Uh, the Rapamil is much the same, thankfully fewer brands there to remember. The dihydropyridines are a much longer list and there are seven key dihydropyridines available in the BNF at the moment. Now I'm going to first of all look at two of them purely because they're not used much in primary care and we can ignore them here on after. The cardapine is a very early calcium channel blocker and the main reason why it still uses it's the only calcium channel blocker that can be given intravenously making it useful in secondary care when managing hypertensive crises. Nimodipine is an oral calcium channel blocker but its pharmacology has a preferential action on the cerebral arteries and this makes it useful in the management of subarachnoid hemorrhage which of course is very little relevant to the primary care clinician. So now we've dispensed with those two, let's look at the rest of them. Now I think the easiest way to do this is classify them by their generation, first, second, third or fourth, which is based on the order in which they were released. Now different publications will classify different drugs in different generations, so you may find if you read elsewhere something I've said is third generation is called second or vice versa. Don't be alarmed, it's, it's not that important. I've taken a kind of consensus view based on the research I've done. Um, the first ones we're going to look at the first generation uh, dihydropyridines uh, and this is the previous mentioned nicardipine but also nephedipine and you do, do still sometimes see immediate release nephedipine uh, in formularies uh, for the management of Raynaud's phenomenon. Now these were the earliest of the calcium channel blockers and they have a very fast onset but a very fast offset it means you need to dose them multiple times a day to get a sustained uh, a sustained effect and makes them very impractical for day-to-day -day use. They also have the added problem that with this short half-life, you can get something called a reflex tachycardia as they wear off. There's very little to be reason to be using these drugs in modern practice, and I personally never do. The second generation is essentially exactly the same drugs, but in a modified release form, allowing less frequent dosing. We do still sometimes see modified release nephedipine uh, in the use of uh, in the management of angina. Now, the third generation is where we start to see the drugs that we're probably a bit more familiar with, including everyone's favourite, amlodipine, but also philodipine. Uh, these drugs were a big step up from the previous versions, as their pharmacology allowed for a much longer half-life, meaning you could do once daily dosing, uh, in the case of amlodipine, without any form of modified release uh, preparation. And finally, we have the fourth generation, which is the candapine and the kidapine. And now these drugs are no more efficacious than their third generation cousins, but they do have advantages in the instance of certain side effects. And we'll come on to that a bit later. And so they are quite important. I do use them regularly in my day to day practice. We're now going to move on to the indications as to why you might want to start a calcium channel blocker. And there are five key reasons why these drugs are used. Of course, probably the most common is hypertension. And after that, the management of stable angina. We also use the non dihydropyridines in the rate control of arrhythmia. And then you often see them used in Raynaud's phenomenon and cluster headache prophylaxis or migraine prophylaxis. Of course, you'll need to use a different calcium channel blocker for each of these. And in the next two sections, I'm going to try and explain why you make that choice and how the drugs exert their effect to solve the issues. So first, we're going to talk a bit about pharmacology. Now, the reason we divide calcium channel blockers into the dihydropyridines and non-dihydropyridines is they have different effects on the body. 
you'll find that the dihydropyridines will work almost exclusively on blood vessels and the vasculature to exert their effects. Verapamil will work almost exclusively on the heart, and dilziazam will work on both simultaneously. Um, I'm going to work through both of these in turn and explain how these drugs exert their effects on these parts of the body. First, let's look at the blood vessels. So, under normal, normal circumstances, calcium influx into myocytes causes myocyte contraction, thus increases total peripheral resistance, thus increases blood pressure. If you block calcium channels, you, don't, you prevent this contraction, thus you get a fall in peripheral resistance, a fall in blood pressure. At the same time, you get reduced cardiac afterload, thus reduced oxygen demand from the heart, thus improved symptoms in stable angina. Yep, it really is that simple. Now, things do get a bit more complicated when we move on to the heart, and I apologise if any electrophysiologists are watching this, because I'm going to make it very, very simple. Non-dihydropyridines have both negative chronotropic and negative ionotropic effects. Looking at the first of these, calcium, is it calcium influx into pacemaker cells is a very important process in the generation of action potentials that thus spread through the heart and generates myocyte contraction. By giving calcium channel blockers, we reduce the firing rates of the aberrant pacemakers, such as the sinoatrial node, and we also slow conduction and prolong repolarization along the atrioventricular node. These two things simultaneously will slow down the heart rate. At the same time as this, these drugs have ionotropic effects, which mirrors how they work in the vasculature. By blocking those calcium channels, we reduce the contractility of myocytes, and thus the ionotropy of the heart. At the same time as this, we dilate those coronary arteries and reduce coronary vasospasm. Add this all together and you get reductions in blood pressure, reductions in heart rate, better oxygen delivery to the myocardium. This is, of course, in addition to that slowing of the heart rate and antiarrhythmic action. There is, a lot, of course, a lot more to it than this, but I hope this explains it in a very straightforward way. As promised, I'm now going to move on to how to use these drugs in your day-to-day -day practice and hopefully translate the pharmacology we've just discussed into real life situations. So first of all, hypertension. Now, you probably already know that dihydropyridines are far more effective as antihypertensives and they generally have fewer side effects. Of all the dihydropyridines, amylodipine is generally the first choice. It has a much more consistent antihypertensive effect when compared with philodipine. So if you're gonna use one, that's why I generally start. Now, if peripheral edema is a problem, and it is with a significant number of our patients, then there is some data that lacandapine or lakidapine will, will cause fewer side effects with equal efficacy in reducing blood pressure. However, these drugs are generally a bit more expensive, so we use amlodipine as our first choice in most formularies. Now, remember that it takes a while for these drugs to achieve a steady state in the bloodstream, and you will need to wait for about one and a half to two weeks of use before you fully assess their response on blood, on blood pressure. So don't be alarmed if eight hours after giving the drug, there's not been a huge change. Now, angina next. So calcium channel blockers are as effective as beta blockers in the management of stable angina. Potentially, if you combine the two classes of drugs together, you get an even greater effect. Remember though that they are purely for symptomatic relief. They do not improve mortality. Now, NICE recommends a non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker in the first instance as a monotherapy if a beta blocker is contraindicated or not tolerated. As I mentioned previously, you may get a better response by combining a calcium channel blocker and a beta blocker together, um, and you can use diltiazem alongside a beta blocker, but you must never use verapamil at the same time. If you're going to combine a calcium channel blocker and a beta blocker, I generally choose a dihydropyridine. Another quick mention, though, that the short-acting dihydropyridines, that is nifedipine mainly, can cause a reflex tachycardia when they wear off, and that can cause worsening of ischemia. So you should never use the short-acting immediate release dihydropyridines for angina. Another mention as well that dihydropyridines are preferred if there is coexistent left ventricular dysfunction, that is a reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. If you are going to use a dihydropyridine, then there's a lot of evidence to support modified release nifedipine, and we often see that. But longer acting agents such as amlodipine and lecandipine are just as efficacious. And if I'm going to choose one, that's generally where I go. Next, we're going to look at arrhythmia. Now, it probably won't be a surprise that for the rate control of arrhythmia, we use a non dihydropyridines And usually by this, we mean rate control and atrial fibrillation. Now, generally, beta blockers are first line, but if you've got someone who can't take a beta blocker for whatever reason, then you could certainly use a non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker as an alternative. 
I'm going to mention it again, that you shouldn't use these drugs if the patient has coexistent heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. If they've got a preserved ejection fraction, then it seems to be okay. I'm going to repeat myself one more time, but this is quite important. You can give someone diltiazem and a beta blocker at the same time, cautiously and with close monitoring, but you must never ever give verapamil at the same time as a beta blocker. This includes if they're taking beta blockers, uh, ocular beta blockers such as timolol. Don't combine these drugs, you can cause a third degree heart block and sudden cardiac death. If you are going to use diltiazem or verapamil, I strongly suggest that you use a modified release preparation for ease of dosing. I'm now going to move on to Raynaud's phenomenon. You'll notice that I didn't cover the pharmacology of this in the earlier section, and that's because the truth is we don't really know. So rather than putting out hypotheses that aren't proven, I'm just going to ignore it altogether. Now, most guidelines will suggest that you use immediate release in the Fedipine for Raynaud's phenomenon. Now, this is mainly down to the fact it's got quite an extensive research base, but there's no evidence that it's any better than using modified release for the Fedipine or indeed the third or fourth generation calcium channel blockers. I tend to use amlodipine for this as it's something we're far more comfortable with and has fewer side effects. Lastly, you do sometimes see calcium channel blockers in the treatment of cluster headaches, the prophylaxis of cluster headaches. Um, there is some evidence out there for their use in migraines as well, but it's not generally within most formularies. Of all the drugs here, verapamil is the single most studied agent, and that's what's most commonly used. Um, if you're going to think about starting this, this patient probably should be under the care of a neurologist, and sometimes very high doses of verapamil are needed, so it needs very careful monitoring. We're now going to move on to the contraindications for starting a calcium channel blocker. And one of the most important and one of the least often heeded is the presence of aortic stenosis. Now, if you've got impaired cardiac outflow, for example, due to aortic stenosis, and you vasodilate the patient with a calcium channel blocker, you can get reduced cardiac output. There's a good study on this, and they basically showed that if you give someone with moderate to severe aortic stenosis a calcium channel blocker, they had worse mortality rates. Now, I couldn't find any data at all on mild aortic stenosis, and I do see cardiologists prescribing calcium channel blockers in mild aortic stenosis, but it seems sensible to me that if you're going to do that, you really need to be having those annual echoes and keeping an eye on that patient and be ready to stop that drug if needed. This means it's quite important before you start a calcium channel blocker that you just take a second to auscultate the heart to identify any obvious murmurs. The next contraindication is one I've already mentioned, and it's the use of non-dihydropyridines in patients with heart failure and a reduced ejection fraction. Now, as we already know, these drugs have a negative ionotropic effect, and they worsen outcome in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, as opposed to dihydropyridines, particularly amlodipine, which have been well studied and seem to be safer. Now, both types of calcium channel blockers seem to be safer in patients with a preserved ejection fraction. So it is important to get an echocardiogram in those patients with raised BMP levels and whom you suspect heart failure. Lastly, we're going to move on to side effects and their management. And probably the most common side effect, which I'm sure we all see very regularly, is peripheral edema. Now, calcium channel blocker related edema is an odd thing in that it can appear decades after the patient's been using calcium channel blockers without problem. So they can start them in their 50s and have no issue and then pitch up in their 70s and their ankles are all swollen. We don't really understand the pathophysiology underlying it. And once it starts, it is just going to progress. So ignoring it probably isn't an option unless the patient's happy with that. You have four options the way you can manage this. Number one, you could start them on a fourth generation calcium channel blocker, such as lecandapine. And I find this often works pretty well, and I'll encourage you to try this first if the drug's otherwise working well for them. Your second option is to add in an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin II receptor antagonist, although, of course, a lot of patients will already be on these anyway. Third option is switch to a different class of drug altogether, or fourth option, like I've mentioned, is just to put up with it and live with it. However, it generally worsens over time, and this isn't ideal. I should point out that calcium channel blocker related edema does not respond to loop diuretics. Do not just stick them on 20 milligrams of furosemide. It's just going to be bad for their kidneys in the long term without any real improvement in their symptoms. The next most common side effect, I think, is dizziness and postural hypotension. And this, we see this particularly in the elderly, usually a result of over medication of their hypertension. Now, there is some evidence that amlodipine causes more falls in the first year following initiation when compared to an ACE inhibitor or a thiazide like diuretic. So if you've got a patient with postural hypotension and is falling over, I generally stop amlodipine or doxazosin before I stop the other types of antihypertensive. Lastly, you do sometimes see facial flushing with 
uh, calcium channel blocker use, more often so in women. There is a hypothesis that all you're really doing there is ex exacerbating an underlying rosacea that had never before appeared, but there's nothing you can do about it. If this is an issue for your patient, your only option is to take them off calcium channel blockers and find a different drug altogether. So this concludes this first episode of Primary Care Pharmacology. I've included a list of references below to explain where I've got my data from. I'd very much appreciate any comments you may have. Feel free to comment on the video or email me at this website address. I'm going to be bringing out more videos, hopefully in the coming months. My next project is working on beta blockers, and I hope I can bring that to you soon. Many thanks for listening. Goodbye.